My name is Quinton Hull. Uh, I work for a company called Huawei, you've probably heard of. Um, my colleague Ying uh, has been working steadily for the last while uh, on our serverless platform. Um, so we're here today to tell you a little bit about that. How do I make this? Oh, there we go. Screens are showing different things. So um, to start with, I'm going to give you a very, very brief introduction to serverless computing. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the domain already, but it seemed useful to just contextualize some of the subsequent discussion. Apologies to those of you who are serverless computing experts. That few minutes might be a little boring to you. Uh, and then Ying is going to take you through the architecture and design of the Huawei serverless platform, uh, which goes by the name of Function Stage. <clears throat> She's going to demonstrate it for you. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about you know, some of the challenges that we faced. Um, these systems are designed for very big kind of enterprise deployments. Uh, so we ran into some interesting challenges, uh, which we'll talk about, some of which we solved and some of which we're still in the process of solving satisfactorily. Um, and then we can have some Q&A at the end if anyone's got uh, questions. <clears throat> so what exactly is serverless computing? Quite sure why this this screen is not showing the same as that screen. Doesn't matter. Unless I what if I push project here? No. Okay, we'll we'll figure it out. Um, so what exactly is serverless computing? So function as a service is the other name often used for it. Essentially, um, I wish I could see better there. But, um, so it's a, it's a cloud computing model for execution of functions. Uh, the, the general idea is that you shouldn't have to worry too much about the infrastructure. All you do is you upload a piece of code, and you chain these pieces of code together in useful ways. Um, the other kind of key element of uh, serverless computing is, is that it's all event driven. So typically these functions execute as a result of certain events happening either inside your infrastructure or inside of your application. Ah, fixed, thank you. Um, which, you know, is not necessarily a, a, a paradigm that all software these days is written to, so it sometimes takes a little bit of a mental mind shift to uh, figure out how to design and, and deploy these applications. Um, the other key element of it is that typically the uh, charge model or the resource allocation model is based on, uh, on the, much more closely to the usage than something like VMs or even containers. Uh, every time you execute the function, uh, you, you pay for the resources uh, associated with the execution of that function as opposed to having some static resource allocation um, like a virtual machine running permanently. Uh, and so for certain uh, use cases, this is very very uh, beneficial if you don't want to have you know, virtual machines running all the time, if you only occasionally need uh, execution capabilities. <clears throat> uh, the other important aspect of it is that it is auto-scaling. So you shouldn't have to worry about how much capacity you need in order to execute these functions. And if you have large uh, spikes up or down uh, in, in your demand, your user demand, uh, the, the platform should automatically take care of that for you and auto scale, and all you really care about is that you're paying per function execution. So you shouldn't have to plan for any of these uh, huge spikes in traffic. Um, and related to the, the resource allocation model I just mentioned, um, the billing is, is similarly uh, tied directly to uh, how many invocations of your functions uh, occur. So you shouldn't in theory, you shouldn't be able to uh, be required to pay anything at all uh, if your functions are not executing. And one of the challenges that comes up is, well, how do you do this if you have functions that clearly need to be uh, you know, instantiated on some kind of virtual machine usually or, or a virtual environment, uh, and you need to wire up a whole bunch of networking to make them all work? Uh, how do you do this instantaneously when the first request comes in and, and you know, 10 milliseconds later you want a response? So there's this cold start uh, challenge, uh, which different uh, serverless computing platforms <coughs> deal with in different ways. Um, and you should definitely, uh, if you are shopping around for a serverless platform, that's one of the areas you should look at. You should either be comfortable with fairly substantial delays on your first execution uh, or cost associated with caching these things um, to make sure that your applications are going to behave in the way that you 
expect them to. Um, and you know, the other aspect, no, no maintenance of virtual machines. You shouldn't be worrying about which version of your virtual machine is running, whether you need to apply security patches, uh, operating system patches, et cetera. <clears throat> and the other, I think, compelling aspect of this is that because there is so little infrastructure management for you and because the programming model is so simple, uh, it lends itself very well to highly uh, to, to high speed iteration, uh, and in fact, in many cases, uh, people who are not traditionally seen as uh, developers or engineers are, are building these serverless applications because they 're much much simpler to think about and deploy and uh, One of the sort of mental models I like to think of of it is uh, i don 't know if any of you can cast your minds as far back as the i guess it was the '80s or the early '90s where uh, Spreadsheets were, were very popular, and all of a sudden you had accountants uh, and HR people writing macros in Excel or whatever it happened to be at the time, and were effectively writing software. They were building applications, although they were not software engineers, but it was so simple for them to do this. They didn't have to worry about compilers and debuggers and all this kind of stuff. They could write macros in, in Excel and, and get quite a lot of stuff done uh, that was traditionally being done by you know, software written on mainframes, et cetera, at the time. <clears throat> so, you know, the end result of all of this is this is what a typical serverless application usually looks like. Uh, in the middle there, you've got a bunch of functions. Uh, these can be invoked uh, in response to any events occurring. Those events could be uh, incoming requests, application level requests. They could be events in the infrastructure, for example, object storage, uh, things being uploaded to objects, changes in a relational database. Uh, results from an artificial intelligence service, for example. <clears throat> and by chaining these functions together uh, through these sets of events, uh, the end result of whatever the application requirement is, is fulfilled. As you can imagine, um, the right-hand side there is a pretty important part of the model. So you need to have typically a bunch of high-level services available to these functions. Uh, you don't usually write those in uh, serverless or within the functions, you tie into much higher level services, AI services, databases, uh, storage services, et cetera, in the back end. And with that, I will hand over to the far more interesting part of this conversation or talk uh, to my colleague, Ying Chong. Oops. Thank you. So, next we'll talk about how do we do that in Huawei Public Cloud. So, I'm sorry, I think this is yours. That's all I can take over. So, current serverless platform products, there are a whole bunch of those. So, you have a lot of options to choose from. First, obviously, the most used, the most successful and their stock price is very high, Amazon. <laughs> also, like, um, this is, uh, I personally worked in Amazon for seven years before. I know they do things very fast. They design from customer perspective. So their business model driven their technical decisions. So I would say this is a wonderful company to choose from, but also consider others as well, because different companies have their different cultures and they give you different features. So followed by Amazon, we also have other serverless cloud function provider, Microsoft, Google, IBM, and others like Kubernetes, Iron, Fissions. I'm only mentioning them because they are relatively smaller than those big giants. But Alibaba and Tencent also are some China cloud uh, provider that uh, they launched the serverless before then Huawei. However, I would think we seriously consider uh, when we do those performance analysis, actually Huawei is getting much faster than theirs. So, well, of course, this is based on a few months ago when we analyzed our product with theirs. So I wouldn't say that uh, they did not uh, speed up, but we are saying Huawei is getting catch up very fast, and we will talk about how we do that later. Also, in addition, we have seen so many big giants, retail and other companies, 
like a robot, Expedia, Nordstrom, Capital One, the financial company, they are using serverless. So consider, when we talk about the security, financial is the most, most secured business, then they are still picking up and they don't have any problem. So let's go to the meet, what? Okay. The architecture of Huawei, serverless. So this is a brief overview of Huawei serverless architect, uh, architecture platform, sorry, platform architecture. So for the green part, we say this is what is already existed and we leverage the existing resources. Serverless platform, we call it function stage in Huawei. It takes the hardware resources provided by Kubernetes and it pulls in the software resources saved in function repository. Combining the hardware and software resource together, we start the function runtime and the actual user function running in the function runtime hosted by Kubernetes port. With these resources, when we have events in object storage, messaging system, and uh, the client API request, any of those events happening, we get this request, server, uh, serverless uh, framework get those requests and uh, start instance for the actual customer request and fulfill the requirement. So to further understand how function stage works, we need to first know how function is modeled in function stage. The definition of a function is combined by two parts, customer resource, a whole bunch of those, and uh, the dependent libraries. The actual function instance that is running in Huawei Cloud is hosted by container. The container has three layers of images. It has OS layer. In function stage, the OS layer is Huawei certified CentOS. It's a Linux version of Red Hat. I'm sorry, it's a Linux and it's a variation of Red Hat, but it's Huawei certified. And uh, the publicly available developed by our service platform, the language specific runtime library. And the most important part, the customer function. So, how this function, function instance running in Huawei Cloud? First, we are, as a serverless application user, I don't know what happens behind the screen. I am outside of the cloud. I'm only sending the request to the cloud, so they don't know the behind the architecture. What do we do behind the screen here? The customer request gets to pick up by API Gateway, and the API Gateway further forward the function call to our function dispatcher. Function dispatcher here saying, if I don't have the here, this is a code start. If there is no such thing as this function instance, we call the Kubernetes API server. They give us our hardware resources. And then the function runtime will be started with the software pulled from the function repository. And then request dispatcher forward the request to the actual runtime. So if this is a code start, if this is a warm start, meaning that the request dispatcher already found the function instance from the instance catch, it is integrated, and then it will directly forward the request to the function instance. So there is no waiting for this part to be start. For asynchronous call, we put this request into Kafka message queue. 
And uh, for client HTTP request, it will be filtered by the HTTP trigger to see whether this is an actual a customer defined API call. And other events started from messaging system or block storage system, and they will also trigger function for them to run as well. Okay? Here's a demo. So this is Huawei Public Cloud. It's not showing up, sorry. Uh. Okay. first. So first, uh, let me define my use case. So as a person who's like travel a lot and I like to take pictures as well, I want to share my best moment with relatively not cra so, so crappy pictures. I like to process my pictures before I send them out, okay? So but I also want to travel light. I don't want to carry my laptop just because I want to process my pictures before I send them out. So what I do, I want a no-cost website because I don't want to pay for that a lot. And uh, this website can upload the picture and uh, process it based on my image processing logic because I could uh, do a lot of programming behind the screen and uh, like what your customer is defined application logic in that, those functions. So here I, I come up with a solution with I'm hosting a website, a static website hosted by Huawei Block Storage. That uh, it, uh, the website, the web page take pictures into our OBS bucket. It's kind of similar to S3. So there's another function that I created in function stage that it will do those image processing for me and the, the up ob object upload events will trigger the function to process that image for me. So, and finally, it will, the process image will be saved into another bucket so that I distinguish between those original and the processed image. Now, here comes to the demo. It's going to be extremely hard if I'm not seeing the demo page. So, is there a way that I can? Oh? It was there. I, I know. I know. Um, but I think. It's here, but I do not see here, see? If I drag it across this, I think it will be... Is there a screen switch? Can I do that? Yeah, it's a screen like this one. Okay, um, let's do this code explanation first. That saves my life. 
so let's see. This is a uh, code that I come up with processing the, so let me see whether I can make it bigger. Room out. Uh, So I have a Python code that deal with three bucket that the upload image upload bucket, the output bucket and the the bucket that hosts my website. The, I put it here mainly because I want to say how many times I've been using this web page. So first, the events that been dumped by OBS uh, I Initially, I don't know what's the structure of the event, so I just dump it here. So that later on, I know how it works. And the start from the code, I got my security information to be used to talk to OBS later. So, and then first start, this function start, I get the image information from the event. So. So this, the function is an event uh, data parser. It gave me the result of the water bucket name and the image name. Afterwards, I down, uh, I'm trying to download the image from the OBS. I give it bucket name, my login credential, and the name that I'm trying to, the file name that I'm trying to download from. save that into local so that my image processor can handle that. Afterwards, I do this transformation. So all those logic that I'm doing this image processing are inside this function, transform image. After it's been transformed, I, be, I will be upload this file to the OBS to be shared later. And I do this counter increase. And yeah. So comes to this transform image here. Using the building uh, function, the PIL library, I, I open this image. And uh, what I do is there are many times that uh, we got our foggy pictures that I want to do defog it first. And uh, afterwards, I want to change it. When I use this defogging uh, library, I found it's not that uh, pretty. Many times it makes it very dull. So I do other, like I make it brighter and uh, make the contrast more, uh, better contrast. And also I do some, have, like the timer, I put in how, how long it takes me to process those image. And here's the part that I, when I talk about the data structure of the events. So I do use those kind of events to, to do local testing. So I don't need to go to the cloud to do all those testing because every time I need to pack up. Okay. So let's see, because the actual uh, running of the loading of this function actually takes a couple of minutes because we are loading back to China. So I would rather save that time. So here, first we go to the object block storage. We can see that uh, the four bucket that is associated with my function. The website, the upload bucket, the process image bucket, and uh, there's another one where I put my function code. I will show you later what's in there. And goes to the function definition. So uh, 
this function I define a trigger here. So the OBS events will trigger the, the upload of the file will trigger the image to be processed by this function. So let's see how it works. So I pick an image here. Let's try a small image first. It's not so good, but at least this is something done by my program, and it uses very small cost, right? We can work on improvement. That's exactly what I'm going to do later. So initially, when we see that the function here, the I have, I'm using this default zip. So that's why I'm trying to here uh, show it inside this bucket where I host my function code. So see. I have two files here. The first one is the original one, okay? And uh, the second one is I come up later. I realized that uh, if I'm using this using my cell phone, the cell phone typically right now they have relatively bigger size of images. I don't want to resize myself, right? So, so I use this uh, program, uh, the Python thing here. So. I added up this part of things later. Say I'm checking the image size. If you are bigger than a certain amount, I want to shrink you so that uh, you don't use a lot of my computing resources. And remember, service function times out within five minutes. So you, you got to be hurry. Don't use a lot of uh, compute when it's not necessary. So what I do here, Just change. So I just save the time of uploading this uh, zip file. And I, I'm here just making the change to I, my function is switching to another set of code. So let's see what it will do. So this is a big function, uh, big picture, sorry. It has three mega. This is the one that I downloaded from my uh, cell phone. So this is a picture I took when I was on the plane. It looks nice, but it's foggy and it's very blurry. So let's see whether it can process it. During my test, it sometimes can, sometimes cannot. <laughs> That's why I recite that. It's going to take quite a while because initially it has to download those more than three megabytes from OBS and then do the resizing. So during my test, oh, here. So it actually behaves well, although we can use a little bit brighter. So, OK. So demo is over. Um, demo is over. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so there's a lot of challenges that we encountered because we want to build this to everybody. We want to be able to host a big customer. And uh, for smaller customer who, who does not have very good experience, we want this to be very, use, very easy to use. And also, there's a lot of big player already in the background, in the area that they start three years before us. So first, let's talk about challenge one, the fast response requirement. So the code start is required to be within two seconds. That's a kind of harder requirement of serverless. So when we start our model, we actually were able to control this code start within 1.5 seconds. But this is only for the container to start without any of this added on VPN and uh, like uh, uh, code uh, loading, all those kind of stuff. And comes back to the actual production environment 
We have so many requests, and we use Kubernetes. The actual performance test for Kubernetes, when we're saying is, when, they tap, when, when we actually need more than two digits of Kubernetes part to start, the performance drops down very dramatically. So sometimes it gives us several minutes to start a report. So what do we do? We were saying that uh, Kubernetes is our hardware provider. And we actually may, may not rely on their performance. So serverless framework should be creative. We invent our own stuff. But still, we are not reinventing the wheel. We're using resource pool, which is providing by Kubernetes. We configure the resource pool first. So think about as a serverless provider platform, we actually, this is not real. So for customer, you don't have those resources. You don't need to pay for that. But for, but for us, we actually already paying for those, no matter you use it or not. So we start, we based on our statistics data, we start a whole bunch of resource pool behind the screen with empty port, with the, the actual function library running there, but not with the actual customer code, okay? So that part save us more than two seconds. When I say more than two seconds, we say, because by Kubernetes port, the start up time is nearly two seconds when it is performed under node, but if, if on the load, then it's more than one, sec, uh, one minute. So, and then secondly, we do the code injection, because we have this resource pool, we need the real customer function to run. So we do the code injection. By the time we get the code, we change the identity of the Kubernetes port to the customer. So they have their real namespace. And another way of we are doing that, so remember, JVM have notor notoriously bad name of starting up very slow. What do we do here? While we use the open JDK uh, uh, resources that we have a uh, JVM lab, they actually was able to start secondary, not the first one. The secondary JVM on the same VM, even though they are not sharing the same container, but they are on the same, same VM, it can share the previous JVM resources and give you a brand new JVM, but it starts much, much faster than the original one. So second challenge is security with usability. There's always the case that should I be more secure or should I provide more usability? Here's the causes. So Huawei internally, we use internally certified Linux system, CentOS. So it is a variation of Red Hat. But internally certified, it stripped out many things that was deemed to be, could be harmful. So, Many, many of the other third-party libraries that are not certified, we are not allowed to build them into the system. So it turns out there are many standard ones. When I try to compute, uh, do my demo, I personally encountered those because I went kind of brand new to Python. And I don't know many of those. It's supposed to be standard because I do not need to download the library. And I can use that for just from the scratch. However, when I try to run that in the cloud, it doesn't work. It says the module doesn't, was not found. So we're saying the, some of the standard library are not there. So I have to be invent for myself. So what's the solution? Dive in, be your own customer, feel the pain, and solve this issue. <laughs> OK, so other challenges, of course. That's why I put here number three to N. <laughs> I'm gonna go over this quick. And we have to catch up the big players because they are ahead for three years, three plus. And we have company VPN consistently blocking us to get some open source code experience, all those kind of, and we have like uh, three country, uh, actual four countries, and uh, two continental coworkers working together. You name it, we have it. Okay, so 
jokes are apart. Here are some resources for our, uh, this is Huawei Cloud. Although it's, the government policy is pretty strict. You have to use your real name to register your account in Huawei Cloud. It is, this is a, a policy by all the cloud providers in China. So I'm sorry if you don't have a Chinese identity, cannot use it. <laughs> and uh, also, but this page, sorry. This product introduction page, uh, I think last time, yeah. They strip it away because this is not in general announcement yet. We are still in the public testing phase, so they stripped it out. But you can see our function examples in the GitHub. It's just called the function stage. So, and the demo, it go, it's my demo. So, but. Uh, I personally paid for that uh, account, and I hope they won't shut it down for a while because I don't have enough Chinese money to pay for it. <laughs> okay, so questions? Yeah, you first. Sorry, this is not open source. Um, sorry. Okay. Yeah. The, can you see it? There it um, yeah, I was just wondering uh, if you've seen like the open source impl implementations or if your solution has um, kind of taken inspiration from any of the open source implementations Definitely. out there? And that, can you yeah. can you also explain how your implementation is different than the major open source implementations? Thank you. So um, before we start, we actually did a lot of research, especially on those open source projects, such as Iron.io, Fission, and Kubeless, and OpenWhisk. Those are lots of inspiration. I would say each project has their own benefit. Many of them, like, they are simple. Something is just simple. The, but however, the performance-wise, not so ideal. And we're saying like the code start has been less than two seconds. So that's our major concern. And also, like because Huawei is aimed to provide an enterprise-grade platform, it has to be able to run in thousands, more than thousands, tens of thousands of function instances at the same time. So we cannot just uh, Use uh, borrow everything from the open source because they, they are pretty, I will say they are still in the early stage. They need some improvement. So we borrow some ideas, definitely, because we use Kubernetes, right? Kubernetes is also is kind of open source and uh, many of these open source projects use Kubernetes as fund foundation as well. So thanks for all those uh, previous uh, open source <laughs> service provider that we are not a lot from you, but uh, we do some comparison. We, we also consistently compare what did we achieved, what we are still lagged behind between all those, like uh, even for this non-open source like Amazon, Azure, we do those comparison, but I'm not posting it here because we are still in public testing. We haven't general announced yet. So we w I guess it will come up later. It's not for me to say we are bad on something, but I promise we are trying to catch. Okay. Uh, the question is, sorry. The question is, do we take any action to prevent uh, our customer to harm other customers? Yes, we do. We do put, uh, we're trying to isolate the customer's action by isolate their uh, container actions. They, are, they have limited available OS layer operations that can be done there. That's why we use our in-house certified CentOS Linux uh, uh, system. So, and we are also still trying to uh, also actively scan 
and prevent it from happening. We're not saying we're done there yet, but we do provide trying to everything that we can, including like uh, control our own OS. We are not open, this, this OS is not borrowed by open source without any internal uh, certification or filtering. So also we do like uh, code scanning for customer code scan, just making sure that they don't have harmful action gonna happen. Uh, this is maybe outside of your uh, area of expertise, but do you know when uh, and if Huawei Cloud will be available to uh, non-Chinese customers? Uh, for US, I cannot say, okay. but uh, one of the major customers of Huawei is uh, in Europe. So we do work with like uh, Digitalcom, Dodge Telecom so in, in, in German. And we, I think we also work with the France te major telecom company. So those those people, they pick up our service product, uh, product. so they were gonna have that there soon. Okay. Cool. okay, thank you everybody.